Hello, and welcome to your most obedient and humble servant. This is a women's history podcast where we feature 18th century women's letters that don't get as much attention as we think they should. I'm your host, Catherine Garrett. I'm a research editor at the Papers of Martha Washington, and today I am joined by my colleague, Mary Wiggy. She is also a research editor at the Papers of Martha Washington, and I am thrilled that she's offered to help out with this podcast. Hi, Mary. Hi. I am so excited to do this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Mary, um, can you tell our audience a little bit about what we do at the Family Papers? Right. Sure. Well, so we search for documents that were either written by Martha or to Martha, and this will include financial and legal documents. And... Uh, we transcribe them, annotate, and do some research, and then publish all of these letters and documents for access to the public. Um, what's your favorite part of our job? Getting to see the actual um, 18th and sometimes even earlier 18th century documents and earlier documents is just so worthwhile. And it's just fascinating to like find these letters and just really, it's curious to find out where they're actually located because absolutely we, we found them all over the place <laughs> <laughs> it in it affects the way you think about sort of the craft of doing history when you think about where the letters are in the archives how they got in the archives how they're organized in those collections it I, I found it really enlightening yeah absolutely do you have an example of something not to put you on the spot but do you have an example <laughs> of something that you found in transcription that you think is really cool that you get from actually looking at the written document that you don't necessarily see once it's out in typescript okay Okay. Uh, there was this one letter that it was from, I remember, it. we found it, uh, I don't even know in what state, but it was over at the Cloud County Historical Society. Okay. Okay. And the document, I think, was, it was Martha uh, to Fanny, her niece, Fasabasa Washington. Mm. This document that um, Martha suggests feeding um, Fanny's husband some breast milk <laughs> 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 to, um, if not cure, to like kind of help him with his ailment, which he was suffering from tuberculosis, so maybe he wouldn't cough up so much blood, which is in the letter. <laughs> oh my so <laughs> it was both fascinating. And then what was even better was our colleague Lynn went to Mount Vernon and found Fanny Bassett Washington's account book. And you oh. can see that she made a purchase for breast milk oh my gosh. around the same time period. So you can kind of you can make the link that she was probably getting that for her husband. And these are just some of the amazing tidbits <laughs> we find in the world of documentary editing. Absolutely. It's not even the weirdest stuff yet. <laughs> Next question. What first drew you to documentary editing? So I studied history in college, and I got a part-time job working over at the Presidential uh, Tape Recording Center with the Miller Center. Mm. And so I was transcribing uh, Lyndon B. Johnson uh, presidential tape recordings. And so... Those are some juicy ones. <laughs> it, was, it was really interesting, especially when he started, like, hanging up on people purposefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I had no idea what documentary editing was until getting the position that we're in now as a research editor with the Washington Papers. And so I first started with transcription of uh, George Washington's uh, financial recordings, mm. uh, financial papers, sorry. From transcription, then it, w it was evolved into doing more document, um, well, document search mm. uh, for Martha's letters and documents. And then it moved on to transcription and research and annotation. And it's just basically broadened into the full scope of documentary editing. So, yeah, I think it started from those early days. Cool. Well, again, I just want to thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. And now let's get into one of these letters. Um, I thought, so as you can probably tell, Mary and I know quite a bit about George and Martha Washington, which is why I decided to do a letter from one of Thomas Jefferson's granddaughters today. <laughs> So we can all get a little bit out of our comfort zones. Um, I'm going to read the letter in full, and then Mary and I are going to dig into what's really fun about it and what we can learn from this particular letter. So here is a little bit of context about the letter we're going to be reading today. All right, yeah, so this is a letter from Thomas Jefferson's granddaughter, Cornelia, uh, from January 28, 1818. 
a little bit of background about Thomas Jefferson's family. Uh, he had six children total who survived to adulthood, two daughters with his wife, and four children with an enslaved woman named Sally Hemings. Uh, after Jefferson retired from the presidency, he invited his oldest daughter, Martha Jefferson Randolph, who he was very close with, some people even say sort of unhealthily close with. Uh, <laughs> uh, he invited her to move into his house, Monticello, with her entire family. Um, she ended up having 11 children, so it was a large family. And the grandkids left behind a lot of really interesting letters and correspondence. Um, Martha Jefferson Randolph had actually uh, gotten a very good French education when Jefferson was minister plenipotentiary to France for five years. So uh, unlike a lot of other young women at this time period, Martha got a very strong education, and she was able to pass that on to her children, her sons and her daughters. So particularly you'll see in uh, compared to some other women's letters of the time, Letters from Martha Jefferson Randolph's daughters are really funny. They're really clever. And you can almost see that they're sort of competing with each other a little bit about who can write the funniest and the cleverest letter. Now, this one is from Martha's fifth child, Cornelia Jefferson Randolph. If you've ever been on a tour at Monticello, um, I used to be a tour guide at Monticello. We would just call her the artist. Um, she drew quite a bit. We have a lot of sketches of Monticello from Cornelia. But when you read her letters, you find out there's a lot more to her than just being an artist. So 1818 is when this letter is written. This is well after Jefferson's retirement from the presidency. Cornelia is 19 years old. Uh, she's writing to her 20-year-old sister-in-law, Jane Hollins Nicholas Randolph, who had married Cornelia's oldest brother in 1815. And she's writing to Jane from Jane's family's house in Richmond. So Cornelia and Ellen were visiting Richmond for the social season. Uh, and it's Cornelia's first time doing the whole introduction into Richmond society thing. Uh, and she's writing sort of news back to her family at home. Uh, her older sister Ellen is with her. Ellen uh, was not being very kind to her sister on this trip. There's some other letters where they write about it. Just to uh, give a little bit more background, Ellen didn't end up getting married till she was 28, which for that time period was very late indeed. <laughs> and Cornelia actually never married. So once we read the letter, I'll see if you can get any idea why. <laughs> <laughs> I just also have to say, like, uh, we haven't even gotten into the actual <laughs> material yet, but like this is the fact that they never got married. It's very impressive. Yeah. And Ellen getting married at the age of 28, like, I could seriously see like people applying the term spinster to her, which hundred <laughs> percent, which Martha Washington's do, like granddaughter does pretty regularly, <laughs> and she's only like eighteen when she's writing her letters. She's like, "I will be a spinster for life." Oh yeah, yeah. They start talking about being spinsters like once they hit twenty. <laughs> it's so hard. It, yeah, it stings. <laughs> um. Okay, okay. All right. So, and now, without further ado, that's a little bit of the context of the letter. I'm going to read it. Richmond, January 28th, 1818. This is the last letter I shall probably write whilst I'm in Richmond, my dear sister, and I must write as if for a wager to be able to finish it in time for the post. I have just received yours and would not answer it at all, but that such favors from you are so rare that they must not be neglected when they do come. And I wanted to tell you that if you expect to find me a stylish lady, you will be most woefully disappointed. I have been twitted at least a thousand times since I have been here with my country breeding and have been in such a rage at the boobies of this place, daring to take notice of it, that even if I had any uneasy feelings from diffidence, that would have got the better of them. But really, I never was more at my ease in my life than from the very first day of my arrival here. At first, I was so disgusted with the nonsense of the people that I sat silent from disdain as much as from anything else. But I soon found that I should spend a most dismal time if I was on the high ropes the whole time I was here. Besides which, I found the people were not such fools as I thought them at first, and that they only had a different sort of folly from what I had been accustomed to. And getting accustomed to everything, I have been very well content ever since." but now I am tired again and want to go home. At first I found the parties the most tiresome places in the world, and that I should in all probability go away without getting acquainted with anyone, for no one would talk to me because I would not talk to them. I thought this was a very hard case, but there was no help for it unless I should humble myself to make some advances, or at least when advances were made to me, to show some inclination to get acquainted with the people who made them, and now some young ladies and myself are very good friends when it suits our convenience. I sat near a young lady for about a half an hour the other day. 
For the first ten minutes, we sat in stately silence, which might have lasted till doomsday for aught that I cared. But she could endure it no longer. And though she did not appear to like my looks any more than I did hers, she turned to me suddenly with a most fascinating manner and sweet smile and asked my opinion of something that she had just done a moment before. I answered her as well as I could, but I am not quick at all at making or turning off a compliment, so I never attempt it. And the girl, though she seemed to expect one at that time, was obliged to be content without it. However, as I did not say anything repulsive, we entered into conversation, and before we parted, were such good friends that we shook hands and promised to meet again very soon and often. I meet that same girl constantly, but it happens never to suit her or me to recognize each other, and we never have spoken since. I still found, though, that I spend a great many weary hours, and that the easiest intercourse among the company was while dancing, so I determined that if it was possible for me to get over my indolence and dislike to skipping about, I should pass my time more agreeably. But a great difficulty now presented itself. I had forgotten the figures of the reels and cotillions as entirely as if I had never learnt them. But this was not allowed to be an objection at all by most people, so the last party I went to I persuaded myself to dance. The gentleman with whom I danced undertook to play the part of dancing master, and then passed a scene which at least afforded me a great deal of amusement. My first partner, Mr. Nivison, was quite as ignorant as I was, and our case was only known to one another. Mr. Wickham, who stood behind and beckoned and made signs only seen to us two who were dancing. I was still more diverted when I danced with Mr. Wickham himself, and I had leisure to attend to his instructions and encouragement. I wish you had been there. I think he would make an admirable dancing master, but I am sure I am very much obliged to him. I am delighted beyond measure to hear that poor little letter mutilated <laughs> Trist has fallen in love with Elizabeth. Another letter mutilated. Must fold up my letter for it is time to send it to the post office. Kiss dear Peg and Pat for me and believe yours affectionately, C.R. And then in a postscript she writes, excuse mistakes. Uh, so, Mary, yeah. tell me what's going on in this letter. <laughs> I, the way, when I first read this, I was like, oh my God, it's 19th century social awkwardness in all its glory. <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I find this one of the most relatable letters that I have been able to find. She writes like an actual human being. Yes. I really enjoyed it for that segment because... I, I don't know which part I enjoyed more. She's like, the so disgusted with the nonsense of the people. It's like essentially an eye roll. Like, I'm done with this scene. <laughs> yes. um, but she's also extremely perceptive. So she understood that like once she actually got to meet them, that it was a, just a different, as she says, a different sort of folly, which yes. I thought I really liked that phrasing mm-hmm. because it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... The fact that she's essentially getting, um, in so many ways, kind of looked down on for her country breeding and her her fashion is nothing new. <laughs> See, now, this is something that I've been thinking about because she is the granddaughter of Thomas Jefferson, who you would think that that, I mean, her grandfather was president of the United States, that that might outdo her uh, country breeding and lack of good manners. Uh, and so it's interesting because like the, the family is heavily in debt at this time. And I do wonder if maybe she wasn't able to afford the same nice dresses as everybody else. And maybe Thomas Jefferson, who I've always imagined as a weird nerd, just <laughs> passed that gene on. <laughs> Okay, so this will show that I didn't really do as much research <laughs> before this. But out of curiosity, did Cornelia do any travel with Jefferson? No, no. She, I mean, I think when, all right, let me think. So she's 20 in 1818. So she was pretty young during his presidency. She was probably maybe like 10 years old towards the end of it. So she might have right. been a little kid and visited him in, in D.C., but she really wouldn't have been taking part in that society. So she probably had spent most of her life a little bit holed up in Monticello. But, like, I mean, even, like, traveling abroad, because doesn't her sister Ellen travel abroad? Yes, to Ellen does, yeah. but that's later. So, oh, yes, okay. her um, okay. Ellen ends up marrying uh, a man named Joseph Coolidge, uh, who, oh, okay, so I don't have the 100% research on this, but it seems like he's involved in, like, the opium trade in China. <laughs> so they go to China, which is pretty wild, um, and... Uh, 
also, I think, one another one of her sisters, they, they several of them travel. Cornelia does not. She sort of ends up um, mostly living in Virginia her whole life. Okay. 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 Yeah. Well, <laughs> the fact that she's like, I don't really care what they think. Complete eye roll again. It's like, <laughs> nah, I don't care. <laughs> that's, oh, that's an, it's like a roller coaster. She'll, she'll say, everyone's so nice. I've never been more comfortable in my life. I hate it. I want to go home. Everyone's great, but they're all so idiots. <laughs> But it's also like she's not making an effort. Like, I know. It takes energy to put in an effort when you're in a new social scene and you're getting to know everybody. Mm -hmm. But she's like, nope, I'm done with this. I want to go home. (laughs) It's very blatant. Yes. But then also, I do think that she is she's funny. Like she's describing she's purposefully describing things in a way that she knows is funny, which I very much enjoy reading. Like, Ab- absolutely right. Uh, when- <laughs> yes, yes, ab- I absolutely agree. I love the part. It's my favorite line. So I might have cracked up when you're reading it, but she's like, "Oh, uh, might have lasted till doomsday for all that I cared." I'm like, "Okay, well." <laughs> yeah, she's like, "Oh, I'm gonna sit next to this girl, and I'm just gonna ice her out." <laughs> But I've been there. I've totally been there. And I totally have done the whole, like, oh, my God, we're friends forever. It's the, like, fake BFFs. It's just completely faking it. And then you run into them all the time. And then you just act like you've never met them in your entire life. Again, highly relatable. Uh, I I wanted to define, there's a sentence where she says that she was thoroughly twitted. Let me see if I can read that again. I have been twitted at least a thousand times since I have been here with my country breeding. And I've been in such a rage at the boobies of this place daring to take notice of it. So uh, twitted, if you're not a (laughs) lady of the 18th century and you don't know what that means, um, means to censure, abrade a person in a good humored or teasing way, uh, to find fault with, to blame, or to taunt. So I feel like she was just getting a little bit roasted. (laughs) Definitely. But the way I saw it, I I agree with you. But (laughs) if they're teasing her, then that means that there's some slight truth in it (laughs) which means that like uh, if if you were to look at a connotation in my opinion i'm like there's some social underlying connotations here like they actually do care like what her fashion is and the fact that she's not meeting like social expectations right how she appears and so (laughs) i'm like teasing okay maybe but if they're being sarcastic there might be truth i don't know (laughs) some (laughs) yeah no i uh yeah, I agree. I sort of feel like this letter is like reading Pride and Prejudice, but from Mary's perspective. <laughs> oh, I agree. I agree. And it doesn't help that they there's old Mr. Wickham involved. Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, man. And the, the dancing. I, don't, I just didn't even know where to start. The dancing like reminds me of Mr. Collins and Elizabeth Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> but the dance instructor... Uh, when I, I mentioned that I was going through um, some of Martha Washington's letters, mm. and she makes note of a payment to a Mr. Christian, who turns out to be a Francis Christian, who was a local uh, Virginian uh, uh, dance instructor. Mm. And so in a journal, there's, um, in the Phidians' journals and letters, there's a quote describing Mr. Christian's uh well, discipline apparently was very strict. Okay. And, okay, so here's the quote. Soon after dinner, we repair to the dancing room again. I observe in the course of the lessons that Mr. Christian is punctual and rigid in his discipline, so strict indeed that he struck two of the young misses for a fault in the course of their performance. Wait, he struck he- them? Yes. It's even said, even in the presence of their mo- of the mother of one of them, and he rebuked one of the young fellows so highly as to tell him he must alter his manner, which he had observed through the course of the dance, to be insolent and wanton or absent himself from the school. Oh, my gosh. Dance instruction was taken very seriously <laughs> in the 18th century. And the fact that she forgot... <laughs> All dance the dance, steps. like all the dance steps, I I understand. I can commiserate, <laughs> but I I find it very surprising <laughs> for something in the 18th century. Definitely would not have gotten a great response from this Mr. Christian. <laughs> but I'm good. I also got the sense that she got a little smitten with the, uh, this Mr. Wiggum. Yes, I also very much got that perspective. A little bit of background. 
I don't know a huge amount about dance instruction at the 18th century, but I did want to dig into it a little bit because I've always wondered while I was watching Pride and Prejudice and movies at this time, how everybody seemed to know all of the steps to all of these dances. So for one thing, this is a highly reassuring letter that not everybody did. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I looked into a little bit about the history of dance instruction at this time. And what they would do, for the most part, is there would be these traveling dance instructors that would go to like a big house in the area. And they would let it be known that they were teaching dance for whatever period of time they were going to be there. And other sort of wealthy people in the area would send their children off right. to the to this house and they would all get instructed like that. So if you have somebody like this, Mr. Christian, that's like swatting kids around the ears, <laughs> <laughs> like that's it, that was his job. Like that's so that's a wild. And then B, I found out that at the end of the dance classes, they would have a huge dance party where even the parents of the kids would dance with them as well. So I thought that sounded oh. kind of fun, actually. Oh, that's really cute. <laughs> yeah. um, and so working at the papers of George Washington, George Washington was nothing if not a dancer. <laughs> um, I don't know at all about Thomas Jefferson and dancing. I mean, I'm sure he did. He was in Paris for five years. But that's something that I really don't know. I do know that his daughter was not very good at the whole high society fashion type thing. She actually, when she was at school, the, her teachers wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson that said that she was just dressing badly. <laughs> yeah, he, he wrote his like teenage daughter a letter that said, if you are a sloven or a slut at the beginning of the day, you will never efface the impression you have made. Oh, my God. Yes. And again, slut did not mean what it does now. <laughs> well, still, that's some real talk to give to your daughter. <laughs> right. So I, I like to imagine that this passed on a little bit to Martha's next generation of kids, that they were just also not this was not the type of society that they excelled in. Okay. Oh, but Mr. Wickham, back to the handsome Mr. Wickham. Right. I don't know if he's handsome or not, but she does say in the letter, I wish you had been there. I think he would make an admirable dancing master, but I am sure I am very much obliged to him. Right. That, I mean, that seems a little fond. And so I think I've, one of, part of what me and Mary do for our job is if somebody is mentioned by name within a letter, we try to identify them. Now, I didn't have a lot of time to do a deep dive into this, but there was a very wealthy Wickham family in Richmond around the time that was related to the attorney John Wickham. So this might have been John Wickham, but he was about 55 at this time. And if you read it the way I read it, that she kind of liked Dancing with Mr. Wickham, it could also be William Fanning Wickham um, of Hanover, Virginia, who was about 25 years old. I think you're... I think you're closer with William Fanning. <laughs> <laughs> with just from just from the context of the letter, that's who I would I would lean towards, and I think that William William Wickham is related to John Wickham. Right. I think he's his son. Okay. Yeah. I, see, that, I didn't go that far. <laughs> I, I briefly also like skimmed through some like some of the research that you had done. I'll admit, <laughs> and uh, there's a number of oh, they might be located at the Virginia Historical Society mm -hmm. um, letters between. Um, the Wickham family, like especially William Fanny Wickham and uh, to Thomas Jefferson. OK, that's probably it then. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, OK. Um, but this Mr. Nivison, I would <laughs> would love to meet him to know, <laughs> to see his dancing <laughs> in the first place. But I, that, that the whole idea of just there being two people that have no idea how to dance and somebody standing behind them, like pointing out where to turn and stuff like that. It just cracks me up. I love that. My second favorite line in this entire letter is, however, as I did not say anything repulsive, <laughs> we entered into conversation. Well, that's good. You know, as long as you said something relatively sane. <laughs> See, that's the line that I most related to. <laughs> I am constantly replaying conversations over in my head after I end them and thinking, oh, I I mean, I wouldn't have used the word repulsive, but it fits the, the feeling. <laughs> yeah, no, that's also like a hilarious image, too. Um, I tried to look up Mr. Nivison, Nivison, my apologies. Um, don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, and I, this one, I'm pretty sure, is William Tazewell Nivison, uh, who, well, I can tell you he was a notary public. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure other people know more about him as a person. But that's what I found. Uh, born 1789, died 1821. So actually only a couple years after this letter was written. Yeah, he was young. Yeah, but uh, he was a, he was 
a gentleman of the right age and family connections who I thought might end up at a ball where Thomas Jefferson's granddaughter would be. Oh, that's another thing I wanted to bring up about balls of the time. There were public balls and private balls, which a public ball, anybody who bought a ticket could go to, like a season ticket right, to. Right, yeah. Uh, and private balls were held in people's homes. So January 18th, uh, this is still the Christmas holiday party season in the South, in Virginia at this time. So I'll bet there were a lot of public and private balls to choose from for this sort of social uh, scene. So Cornelia, when she's talking about meeting all of these people and not liking a whole lot of people, that's what she's talking about. And related to that, during um, George Washington's presidency, Martha Washington is also paying for tickets to go to assemblies and taking her granddaughter. Yes. Um, yeah, Eleanor Park Custis. And I, it's definitely a great introductory into the social scene because what a way to so <laughs> network socially, which I mean... I think would have been to Cornelia's benefit if she <laughs> – it sounds like she put in an effort at a certain point until, you know, the time she wants to go home. <laughs> but, but, yeah, no, uh, certainly like a way to really connect with other people. I mean – I mean, I like part of me really wants – like feels like that would be super fun. But then the other part of me knows that – I am Cornelia. <laughs> as, as I mock Cornelia, I know that I that this is who I would be. Honestly, like I just was picturing the entire, nearly entire time I was reading this letter, I was like, this sounds extremely, like relatable <laughs> and, and like similar to Pride and Prejudice. Yes, I just I, saw the entire movie <laughs> play out in this one letter. <laughs> It just shared so much, just like about social engagement and essentially social awkwardness. <laughs> and, yes. And just like, I, I don't know, just like, as I was saying, like networking, but also fashion and then conversation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, so that's another interesting thing about being a, a young woman of this class at this time is you really do have a brief window where you get to go to these fun parties and things. So it's like. I mean, a lot of people get married quite young. The woman that she's writing to, um, her sister-in-law, she's only 20 years old, but she got married when she was 17. Um, and you'll know, at the end of the letter, Cornelia signed off saying, kiss dear Peg and Pad for me. So this is a 20-year-old that has a 2-year-old and a 1-year-old daughter uh, already. And so one of the reasons that Cornelia might want to update her with the news is this is sort of this fun, young youthful lifestyle that's so brief, such a brief window in the lives of a lot of these women that you sort of have to take advantage of it. Yeah. So, okay. So as you were introducing these like cast of characters, um, mm -hmm. you mentioned Ellen. So she gets married when she's 28. So like, <laughs> it almost makes me wonder if she just held out as long as possible <laughs> because she knew her span of like having this like fun social occasion was gonna close immediately <laughs> upon marriage. That's a great yeah, no, that's a great perspective. I know a lot of Jefferson's granddaughters um had a hard time getting married. There's a funny letter from their mom um where she talks about uh her one of her youngest daughter um, Septimia, named Septimia because she's the seventh daughter. Uh, not even seventh child, seventh daughter. That's <laughs> just lazy. <laughs> <laughs> and she, um, when she's sending her out into the social scene, she's like, congratulations, your dowry, or what is it, your dower is uh, five cents a year. <laughs> Good luck. Because <laughs> uh, Jefferson was over $100,000 in debt when he died. People were pretty much aware of this. So you really, if somebody was going to be courting these daughters, it was either because they were just like really just great people. <laughs> <laughs> she had a great personality. She had a really great personality. <laughs> Maybe they're beautiful. Uh, Septimia was known for being absolutely stunning. And even Ellen um, was, uh, con was, people would write that she was beautiful. Um, of course, it's tough when you're reading these letters about like a founding father's granddaughter. Everybody always describes them as beautiful. Of course. Um, but they didn't have any money. So there wasn't uh, a, for this sort of class of culture where a lot of people and Pride and Prejudice type time period, people are getting married for money, for financial security. And they're on that count, these women didn't have a lot to offer. Oh, and the um, bit where she talks about, I wish I knew more about the gossip where she says, poor little Trist has fallen in love with Elizabeth. That could be 
two different people named Trist. Uh, Nicholas Trist ended up marrying Cornelia's sister, Virginia, or maybe his brother, uh, Hor Browse Trist, but I don't know if he's living in the area at this time. That would be something I'd have to dig more into. But I, one of my favorite things about women's letters is when they're just writing the gossip of who's courting who and who's in love with who. <laughs> it's fascinating, like, how much, like, social, like, gossip and rumors and like has not all it's just it also just hasn't changed like, oh yeah at all <laughs> and so it, it's a real eye opener when you get to like do this research and like nothing has really it's all pretty much the same <laughs> it's social <Yeah>. dynamics <laughs> social, social connections yeah 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 we don't have to memorize dance moves anymore but the vibe of being young and single and meeting new people is very much similar do you think in your heart of hearts that she actually was cool with nobody liking her or people were just being super mean? I could see it both ways. I, yeah. Um, I mean, I can see people being super mean and then you decide, well, I'm done with this. <laughs> <laughs> I, but like, so I love the fact that she's like, I'm so disgusted with the nonsense of the people. Right. She's not of the, like, of them. It's the people. <laughs> so as, uh, as if she's like looking down on them. Uh, but I I can almost sense, like, she wouldn't bring it up unless she was kind of, like, insecure or just, like, she was questioning it and maybe questioning, like, her own behavior. Unless she just wants to share this, like, great amount of detail with her sister-in-law, which was could also right. be the case. This is hilarious. This is, like, the stuff that I love. <laughs> I, mean, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> but it's so juicy. Oh, yeah. And it gives so much, like, life and personality to, like a piece of paper that you're reading and so yeah no, yeah that's yeah. fascinating <laughs> yeah you get these 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 old letters and the humanity just sort of comes out of them a lot particularly in family letters and when women are writing to each other oh it's fantastic <laughs> To all of my listeners, I want to thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, I will have show notes and cite some of the sources that I found uh, on the website when I post this. And as ever, I just want you to know that I am your most obedient and humble servant. Thank you very much. This is Catherine again, just checking in to say thank you so much for listening to Your Most Obedient and Humble Servant. Uh, we've got some exciting things coming up on the horizon. For one thing, uh, I've been working on a website that's just about ready to go live. Also, if you want to follow us on Facebook, we've created a Facebook group for Your Most Obedient and Humble Servant. As always, you can find us on Twitter and Tumblr as well. Just search for Your Most Obedient and Humble Servant or H-U-M-S-E-R-V-T. The next episode is going to be a little bit of a change of pace. Instead of featuring a letter from a wealthy white slaveholding woman, as a lot of our previous letters have been, this letter is actually coming from an enslaved woman herself. So please stay tuned for that. Uh, it definitely shows a different perspective of womanhood in the 18th and early 19th century from what we've seen so far. And I'm pretty excited. I think it came out pretty well. Uh, once again, I just want to thank you so much for listening. I've just been so excited about the support the podcast has received so far, and I hope to keep being able to continue making episodes and find more and more of these interesting and diverse letters. If you know somebody who might be interested in listening to the podcast, let them know. Uh, word of mouth is always the best way to spread awareness about the podcast. And once again, I just can't tell you how grateful I am. Thank you very much.